Saint G. Magalgani, Passionists, 1903, Lucca, Italy. Saint Gemma's death, a victim of expiation. The life of blessed Gemma was drawing to its close. Her whole existence for 25 years had been marked by the purest innocence and the most intense love of God. The program she had mapped out for herself, namely, to belong entirely to Jesus and to live for him alone, had been faithfully and completely carried out. On the Feast of Pentecost, 1902, her soul seemed to have been set on fire with the flames of divine love. On that day there was an abundance of heavenly communications. She was more than usually recollected and it was noticed that she was breathing deeply. And in the midst of these ardors Jesus once more spoke to his faithful servant, I desire, he said, a great expiation to be made, particularly for the sins and the sacrileges by which I am offended. This new complaint of her divine spouse moved Jima's heart profoundly. What would she not have done for him? Then, when he asked her whether she would undertake the expiation of these offenses, she answered, O oh Jesus, you know I'm most willing to do so. Yes, O oh Jesus, unburden thyself upon me, and glorify thyself in me. Thy miserable creature. Her offering was accepted. She became seriously ill. For two whole months her stomach could retain no food, her only nourishment during all this time being a little wine. Although it was obvious that she was suffering, no one understood what was the matter with her. Towards the end of June, she exclaimed, O oh Jesus, we have almost come to the end of thy month. It has been entirely thine. When Father Germanus heard what was happening to his spiritual child, he wrote before the month was out, In the name of Jesus I command you that at the end of June you must return to your previous state of good health. Ask Jesus to do this because of holy obedience. She obeyed and prayed. Jesus gave her to understand that out of regard for obedience and in order to show that he was indeed the author of what was taking place in her, he would cure her, but only for a little while. That she would again fall sick and never get better. And so it happened. Jima was restored to her former health and strength, her usual color returning to her cheeks, but after three weeks or so she had a relapse. In September, following an apparition of the Blessed Virgin an apparition spoken of in the course of this book, Jima was once again restored to health. But it was only for a short time. She then became feverish and often coughed up blood from her lungs. But this innocent victim had something more to suffer than mere physical pain. To intensify her martyrdom and render her holocaust more pleasing in his sight, God withdrew all supernatural communications. Except for infrequent and momentary lights she was alone, without a ray of comfort. This was the great sorrow which Jesus had told her was to overshadow the end of her life. Her dreadful sufferings soon reduced her to a skeleton. She was a prey to the most awful desolation of soul. It was sometimes thought that the end was near, and some of the household watched by her bedside all night. The doctors did not know what to do. Cecilia Giannini wrote to Father Germanis asking him to come and comfort Gima, and advise the family what they should do in the emergency. In October, Father Germanis came. Gima wanted to get up to receive him, but he sent her a command that she was to remain in bed. Earl. Gima. What are we going to do? He asked her as he sat by her bed. I'm going away with Jesus, Father, she answered, full of the liveliest joy. Tis time Jesus has made it quite clear. To heaven, Father, to Jesus. With Jesus in heaven. But what about your sins? Objected Father Germanus. Jesus has thought of that, she said. Single quote he will make me suffer so much in the short time I have to live and so sanctify these sufferings by the merits of his passion, that his divine justice will be satisfied and he will then take me with him to paradise. But if I do not want you to die yet? But if Jesus desires me to die, what then? They continued to talk together. They discussed the particulars of her death, the reception of the last sacraments, her burial, and the care of her body which she did not want any profane hands to touch, because of Jesus, she said. That evening Father Germanis once again heard her general confession. On the following morning she received the Holy Viaticum. In spite of her fever she did not want to break a fast even with the drop of water. She sat up in bed, with assistance, dressed as a bride with a white veil on her head. She had spent the whole night in fervent preparation, her heart on fire with loving expectation. Father Germanis retired to a corner of the room to pray. The priest came with the blessed sacrament 
but Jimla was already she was detached from everything and everybody, and in the end even from me, so that I began to think that she no longer cared whether I was near her or not. I therefore reproved her, pointing out that she was ungrateful and that Jesus could not be pleased with her conduct. Have I not done a little for you? I concluded, and Jesus rewards even a glass of water given in his name. I have indeed made many a sacrifice for you. How is it that you utter not a word even though I am reproaching you with being ungrateful? She answered, But what are you saying? If there is one person in the world I have loved it is you. And with that she began to weep. Do whatever seems best to you, I said. I will not say another word about the matter. Jima then continued it was about a month or so before her death, nothing remains for me to do now except prepare for death, because I have made a sacrifice of everything. Even of Father Germanus? I asked. Yes, she answered, even of him. If Cecilia Giannini could have read her adopted child's heart she would not have been disturbed by such fears. In writing to Father Germanus Gemma revealed her inmost thoughts. After taking away my earthly mother, she confided to him, Jesus gave her back to me in the person of Aunt Cecilia. But now I am orphaned once more. Twice I have been an orphan on earth. When the question of her leaving the Giannini's was still under consideration, Father Paul Day, who knew her well, when alone with her one day, said, You know, of course, that they want you to go away because there is a possibility of your having tuberculosis? They are doing what is right, she replied calmly, but all the same I have not got tuberculosis. But Jima, Father Day continued, You don't possess a penny, and what will you do when they put you out on the roadside? She smiled, Father, is not God also on the roadside? Where God is, there are all things. A sublime answer indeed, an answer that reveals Jima's inimitable candor and her childlike abandonment in the loving arms of God. Sufferings upon sufferings. Jima's sickness continued its course with all the usual improvements and sudden relapses. Its acute crises were terrifying, and it was often necessary to give her oxygen to revive her. These sufferings increased in intensity as her death drew nearer. Her sufferings were unheard of. Thus the Carmelite, Sister Gisilda, summarizes the various depositions made in the processes. Her stomach could retain no food, not even a few drops of liquid, and the vomiting increased the pain in all her limbs, each of which suffered its own particular martyrdom. Her cough racked her whole body and she had great difficulty in breathing. Then the Lord took away her sight and her voice grew so weak that she could scarcely speak. Nevertheless, in spite of this, she never craved for any alleviation, or looked tired or sad. She never asked to be moved or raised in bed, even though she was lying in an uncomfortable position. During the whole of her illness, declared Mother Giannini, single quote as she asked for nothing, not even a drop of water. The Barbantine sisters who had attended to her previously were asked to nurse her. This was done because, Doubtless through some misunderstanding, she had been left alone a few nights when she had been in particular need of assistance. But she had not complained. Jima's room was a school of virtue. The sisters never saw in her angelic face any trace of melancholy or of suffering. She was always calm and full of peace. Jima and the sisters once spent an entire night in talking about God. The sisters were edified by her conversation, and on the other hand she was helped thereby to concentrate her mind on prayer. Let us say our prayers together, she said to them. Let us occupy ourselves with nothing except Jesus alone. Once at the height of her sufferings they asked her, if Jesus allowed you to choose between going to heaven immediately and remaining here to suffer on the understanding that this latter would redound to his greater glory, what would you do? She answered, it is better to suffer than to go to heaven, if it is a question of suffering for Jesus, and promoting his glory. The intensity of her pain, and more frequently, the violence of the assaults of the devil, sometimes drew from her such complaints as this, O oh my Jesus, I can bear no more. And of the sisters at once remarked that with God's grace all things can be borne, and from that time whenever visitors said to her with compassion, Poor thing! I'm sure you cannot bear much more, she immediately replied, single quote why yes, I can bear a little more. Even in the midst of her sufferings, she never changed. The ingenuous simplicity that characterized her life was just as observable during her last days on earth. A school of virtue. A virtue that shone forth conspicuously in Jima during her last illness, was her humility. 
one could not help being profoundly moved on hearing her ask Jesus and Mary to pardon her faults she whose life on earth had been always so angelic. Her favorite ejaculatory prayer was, Me Jesus, mercy. She prayed continually. A large crucifix hung on the wall of her room, on her right hand, and in front of her bed the picture of the Blessed Virgin. When she was so exhausted that she could not speak, she still fixed her mind on God. One had only to see her face to realize how recollected she was. Monsignor, she used to say, told me that when I could not pray with my lips I was to pray with my mind and heart, and I am doing so. Before she lost her sight she used to read St. Alphonsus Liguri's Preparation for Death. Are you not sorry you are going to die? Gima? She was sometimes asked by Cecilia Giannini. Oh, no, she replied, I have no longer any attachment to anyone in this world. When Cecilia knelt by the bedside, weeping, Gima comforted her by saying, Aunt, I know your character. You worry too much. You are upset at seeing me suffer so much. Go away, go away far from me. Yes, go away and do not worry so much about me. She had good word for everyone, and was most grateful for any attention. One day Gima overheard Cecilia Giannini encouraging the sisters by reminding them of the recompense they would receive. On hearing this, Gima's face lit up. No, no, she said, leave that to me. I will think of the sisters when I am with Jesus. Gima was always happy with children. It was a case of like meeting like. While she was at the Giannina's her benefactors the children were often with her, and when she had left they often asked to be taken to see her. And she always had a kind word and a smile for them and gave them the cakes and other dainties which had been sent to her by friends. She did not forget the mantelate nuns but sent them sweets and other delicacies. Whenever she received anything that was good to eat, attested Sister Julia of St. Joseph, single quote as she put it aside for Sister Mary. She knew that we nuns are poor. On the last day of her life, her sister Angelina visited her and burst out crying. Gima tried to comfort her. Don't cry, Angelina, she said, there is nothing to be sorry about. And then she asked Angelina's pardon for the bad example she had given. It need not be said that this only grieved Angelina all the more. She began to cry again and in her turn asked Gima's pardon. Think no more about it, said Gima on saying goodbye, but try to be good. Struggle with the infuriated demons. Jima had to endure more than the sufferings caused by her sickness. During her last days the devil attacked her violently. It would seem as if the powers of hell were determined to make her pay dearly for all the victories she had gained over them. But these new assaults supplied her with new opportunities for further triumphs, and could end only in their greater confusion. From October until the day of her death, declared Mother Jima Giannini, single quote as she was tormented by the devil, who appeared to her under horrible forms. I often saw her bed shake, and the servant of God like one who had fainted after a cruel beating. Sometimes after these diabolical attacks an indescribably fetid odor seemed to hang about the room. Jima had been forewarned in ecstasy about the violent struggle she was to engage in with the powers of evil until her death. Cecilia Giannini has left us the following account, I heard her say one day in ecstasy, provided you art, not glorified less, do what you desire with me but give me strength and help me. A few days later I asked Jima to explain these words. What new thing is going to happen Jima? I asked. There will be a great struggle, she answered, and it will be the biggest and the last. Above all, the devil sought to drive her to despair. So this is the reward for all your sacrifices in the service of God, he suggested. And then there came before her imagination all the sad vicissitudes of her sorrowful life, the misfortunes that befell her family, the death of her father, the heartless creditors who even searched the children's pockets, her various painful sicknesses. She was tempted to think that she was a victim of delusion and hypocrisy. She began to fear that she had deceived everybody and that her life had been one long act of deception. This imagining filled her with fear and dread. She had to do something about it, so she wrote as well as she could in that trouble of mind, a confession of her whole life and sent it to a priest with a request that he should come and give her absolution. He came and reassured her, and once more her soul was in peace. The devil, however, did not give up the struggle. He redoubled his evil efforts and assailed her in other ways in the hope of making her angry or lose patience. But again he failed. 
The temptation, however, which afflicted Jima most cruelly was that which was directed against holy purity. The poor girl wrote in desperation to her faraway director, Father, this suffering is too much for me. Ask Jesus to change it into something else. From where you are send threats and exorcisms to drive away this beast, or send your guardian angel to hunt him out of this place. The beast, declared Cecilia Giannini, almost killed Jima. I came away from her room weeping. The brute was determined to have her and she had no protection. There were deafening blows, and the devil assuming the form of ferocious animals tormented her. We used to help her by sprinkling holy water over the room. The commotion would cease then, only to begin again worse than ever. The few drops of liquid she could retain in her stomach were made sickening and disgusting by the appearance in them of revolting and horrible insects. Filthy animals used to crawl about under the bedclothes and a snake twisted itself round her from head to foot, trying to suffocate her. She asked that exorcisms should be employed, but when her request was not granted, she took it upon herself to make them, evil spirits. She commanded, I order you to go back to the place to which you belong, otherwise I shall accuse you before my God. And then she would turn to the Blessed Virgin and in the voice that brought tears to the eyes of those who heard it, say, O oh mother mine, I am in the hands of the devil, who is tormenting me, who beats and scourges me. O oh Jesus, do not abandon me. O oh Mary, pray to Jesus for me. After each assault, her one thought was had she offended Jesus. Where art you, O oh Jesus? She would be heard to say repeatedly. Do not think that I want to do aught else but thy holy will. You know the truth, for you see my heart, O oh Jesus, if it be thy good pleasure, give me a little respite. I feel that the struggle is almost too much for me. So please grant me a little rest, Jesus. And Jesus heard her prayer, but the moments of peace in which he and her guardian angel used to encourage her to persevere bravely, were short and rare. The storm would burst upon her more furiously than before. It was in this manner that Jima, an innocent victim, passed her days and nights on her bed of sorrow. But the abandonment had to be absolutely complete. It would seem that she was receiving too much assistance, too much strength from Holy Communion, and she had to make a sacrifice to Jesus even of this. Mother Jima Giannini deposed, during her sickness she continued to receive Holy Communion every day. Because of the strain on her health we wished to prevent her from receiving, but Monsignor Volpi told us to allow her to go saying that this was the only consolation that remained to her. Early in the morning I accompanied her to the Church of the Rose and afterwards came back home with her. A fortnight before her death, I took her to the church as usual, but she was so weak that she was unable to go to the rails, and in consequence she did not receive Holy Communion that day, and this was a great sacrifice for her. It was to this church also that Mother Jima, then Apahemia Giannini, used to go with Jima for the devotions of the month of March in honor of Saint Joseph. Jima always had a special devotion to this patron of a happy death, and desired to make sure of his powerful assistance in the last moments of her life. Opahemia Giannini looked after Jima with sisterly care, and in giving evidence in the processes spoke with particular emotion of the following incident. During one of Jima's violent attacks of coughing, that seemed to be on the point of suffocating her, Ophemia was standing by the bed lovingly attentive. Jima looked up at her lovingly to say, Learn, Ophemia, how Jesus desires to be loved. Jima lived for a month at her new home, her last earthly dwelling place. During this period Father Peter Paul Moreschini came to give her his blessing for the last time. She was overjoyed at seeing once more one whom God himself had won to her cause and who had helped her so much in the days of trial. Father Peter Paul Moreschini gave the following deposition in the processes regarding this visit, I heard her confession and knew that she was in a state of unmitigated suffering. The afflictions she was subjected to by the devils were unceasing day or night. Her illness, which according to the doctors was tuberculosis, had reduced her to an extremely weak condition, and I was persuaded that her death could not be far off. The gates of heaven opening to revive Saint Jima. Jima's death was indeed near. Heaven was about to open and welcome her within its gates forever that abode of the blessed she had sighed after in life. Make haste, O oh Jesus! Give me strength and make haste! She was heard to exclaim in ecstasy, but shorten the time that is now so wearisome to me. Break this chain that binds me to earth and holds me back from heaven. Let me come to thee. And again, O oh paradise, 
In thee there will be neither night nor darkness, nor changes of things or time. O paradise, where God of God and light of light dwells. It is illumined by the sun of justice and the sacred heart will fill it with divine brightness. For the consolation and joy of heaven is indeed to contemplate God, the King of Kings. O paradise, how long have I desired thee? Who can ever describe thee? A desire that never annoys, a plenty that one never grows weary of. What happiness, O Jesus, to dwell in thy paradise! On hearing these outpourings, Cecilia Giannini had asked Jima, Why do you desire so greatly to go to heaven? Have you not got Jesus here? Single quote why yes, she answered, but I do not see him as he is in heaven. One day I did see him a little better, but my eyes were burnt by the sight. And then I remembered, continued Cecilia Giannini in her deposition, that I had once noticed that her eyes were sore and red, and that I had scolded her, saying, Even your eyes are sore. There is not a bit of you healthy. But she kept silent, and on the following day her eyes were all right. Holy Week of 1903 came, and it was to be for Jima indeed a week of the Passion. From the pains she suffered in her body, from the deathly pallor of her face and the anguish of abandonment she experienced in her soul, she seemed, according to the witnesses, an image of Christ dying on the cross. A life of sorrow in martyrdom could have only such an end. She had longed and prayed to die on a great feast and her prayer was granted. Saint Gemma would die on the Feast of Feasts, Holy Week, Easter. On Wednesday of that Holy Week she was allowed to have even on her bed of sorrow a slight foretaste of the reward that awaited her. When she came out of an ecstasy, the sister asked her if Jesus had consoled her. Oh, she answered, if you were to have even a glimpse of what Jesus allowed me see, you would be overjoyed. On that same day she received the Holy Viaticum. From March the 23rd she had been deprived of Jesus, who had always been her all, her very life. She desired to receive him again on Holy Thursday. So as not to be disappointed she remained fasting in spite of the burning thirst she suffered. It was another heavenly scene. After receiving Holy Communion she was wrapped into ecstasy and saw a crown of thorns. Before all thy work will be accomplished, she was heard to say, what a lot will have to be suffered. Afterwards she said to the sister who was attending her, what a day tomorrow will be. It is finished. The following day was Good Friday. At about ten o'clock Cecilia Giannini, tired out and sleepy, wished to go home and rest, but Gemma begged of her to remain. Do not go away, she said, until I am nailed to the cross. I have to be crucified with Jesus. Jesus has told me that his children ought to die crucified. After some time she was wrapped into a profound ecstasy. She stretched out her arms and remained in that position until half past one. She did not speak, but one could read in her countenance the pain she was suffering and the love that filled her heart. She was in agony with Christ on the cross. The rest of that day and the following night was passed in continual suffering. At eight o'clock in the morning of Holy Saturday she received extreme unction, following with a singular devotion its administration. According to Monsignor Volpi and Elisa Galgani, she again received Holy Communion. In the meantime those who could console had retired. Her likeness to Jesus crucified had to be complete. Neither her confessor nor her director was present. Only a few charitable women were near her, their sorrow increasing hers, as the sorrow of the women on Calvary increased the sufferings of the Saviour. At first she had expressed a desire that a telegram should be sent to Father Germanus. But she let the matter rest there, having also made a sacrifice of his presence. The priests who had given her holy viaticum and administered extreme unction, she did not see again. A priest and a Christian is all I want, she had said, or as Canon and Duke's tea records, a crucifix and a priest is all I require when I am dying. She had prayed to die without any comfort and her prayer was granted. Even God withdrew his sensible presence. Her mind was no longer illumined by his light nor her heart warmed by the slightest consolation. And to crown her desolation the powers of hell launched upon her its fiercest attacks. Monsignor Volpi was summoned. He gave her absolution and tried to comfort her. Gemma would have liked him to use the exorcisms, for she saw the devil near her under a horrible form and threatening her. The ravages of her disease had exhausted and emaciated her, but in spite of this, her body became so heavy a short time before her death that three people could not lift her in bed. When she was told this she remarked, It is not I who am so heavy. 
Nevertheless, both Canon and Duke City and Monsignor Volby refused to use the exorcisms. After the latter had given her his blessing he asked her if she was now content. She answered, no. Fujima desired that he should use the exorcism to free her from the devil, who was tormenting her. Monsignor Volpi then left to return no more. When Jima understood that on account of urgent business Monsignor Volpi could not remain with her, she took her crucifix into her hands and, raising it up before her eyes, said, See, O oh Jesus, now indeed I can bear no more. If it be thy will, take me. Then turning to a picture of the Blessed Virgin she prayed, Mother mine, I recommend my soul to thee. Ask Jesus to have mercy on me. She kissed the crucifix and, placing it over her heart, her hands joined above it, she closed her eyes and remained motionless. Later on the parish priest, Canon Angeli, came and was with her to the end. Let us reconstruct the scene. Jima was raised up in bed with her head resting on the shoulder of Signora Justina Giannini. Opahemia Giannini was kneeling weeping, her head bent down over Jima's right hand, which she was holding in hers. The others were standing with their eyes fixed upon the dying girl. When Cecilia Giannini saw that Jima was sinking fast she hurried to call the other members of the family. Jima is dying, she announced. Everyone except the young children hastened to Jima's bedside. At half past one she took a turn for the worse and then without even a tear or a deep sigh, she ceased to breathe, a smile meanwhile illumining that face which, in spite of the ravages of sickness, had always remained beautiful. Thus blessed Jima died, as a child goes to sleep in its mother's arms. The parish priest, who was reciting the prayers of the church for the dying, asked, Is she dead? Jima was indeed dead. The parish priest began to intone the de profundis. This scattered the last illusions, and everyone in the room burst out crying. But the angels in paradise must have sung a hymn of glory. Once again the words of St. Paul the Apostle have been verified, if we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified with him. Amen. St. Jima's holy death took place on Holy Saturday the 11th of April, 1903. Amen.